First and foremost, I want to give all praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem Rukah Kadash. Double honors to the elders and apostles of Great Millstone who rule well. Much respect to the brothers laboring in this truth worldwide. It's your brother Dawada coming to you with another lesson. And uh, this lesson is going to be more highlighting how the wicked are exchanged from the womb, man. You know, they uh, set up systems to cause strife and division. They set up systems to keep our people oppressed. And it's all done by under the guise of wicked lies, right? So I came, uh, <clears throat> Salakia, came across this video uh, on my recommended list. Um, and um, I watched it three days ago, I think the 28th, four days ago, no, three days ago, Salakia. And uh, it was the same day that Apostle Elder Aramala had did the article on the Washington Post and it tied together perfectly, right? And I think that article on the Washington Post was um, America's Truth. Uh, and let's go into this video. Well, first, let me read this scripture right here. This is Psalms chapter 58 and verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb they go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies, right? I want to look at this word, estranged. H21. So like it. Let me make sure I clicked on the right one. Okay. H21. 14. Zor. Zor. To be strange, be a stranger, become a strange, strange, another stranger, foreign, an enemy, right? So most of our guys letting them know, man, this is your enemy, man. And if you ain't know that by now, man, there's something wrong with you. Let's look at this video. Listen to how this textbook describes slavery. The master often had a barbecue or a picnic for his slaves. Then they had a great frolic. Even while working in the cotton fields, they sang songs. The beat of the music and the richness of their voices made work seem... Now look at this damn devil right here, man. You see what this damn devil has on his shirt? Let trans women live. Get the fuck out of here, Esau. That's why your ass gotta be put the fuck away. Light. Yikes, that's from History of Georgia, a textbook published in 1954 that was taught across junior high schools in Georgia for decades. That sort of language is part of an intellectual movement called the Lost Cause, a distorted version of American Civil War. Hey, man, that's spiritual, man. <laughs> hey, that's spiritual, man. Make America great again. The Lost Cause, man. That's this is the Lost Cause for you, Esau, man, because your ass will never be great again. Understand that, man history that's been prevalent in the South for a long time. It took shape soon after the defeat of the Confederate States in the war, when Southern historians like Edward Pollard and former Confederate General Jubal Early started preserving the South's perspective through their writings. They framed the Confederate cause as a... Hey man, the brothers went into that word framed again, man. That word framed. Matter of fact, let's, let's look it up, man. They framed the seat, man. Right? Look it up. All right. This is Isaiah. Okay. This is Isaiah 29 and 16. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing frame say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? That's what Esau saying of the Most High God, man. His turning the upside down, what that wicked ass dude had on his shirt, man. Damn, trans, let trans women live. And the Most High God said, put him to death, right? Let's go into this word frame, man. 
Because they, they, they frame the seat all the time, right? This is uh, H33, 35. Strong's H33, 36. So like a 36. Yates said. It says form, framing, process, so like your purpose, framework, form, pottery, right? Man, purpose, imagination, device. So this is the device that these motherfucking devils came up with, right? And we're going to get to that article. When Southern historians like Edward Pollard and former Confederate General Jubal Early started preserving the South's perspective through their writings, they framed the Confederate cause as a heroic defense of the Southern way of life against the overwhelming forces in the North. That narrative has a few basic tenets. The glorification of Confederate soldiers who died for a cause they believed in, the belief that slavery was a benevolent institution, and maybe most importantly, that slavery was not the root cause of the war. The lost cause is one of the most notorious effective efforts to rewrite history and it was done by the losing side so how did it become so deeply rooted in southern memory blame the united daughters of the confederacy see this to rewrite history and it was done by the losing side so how did it become so deeply rooted in southern memory blame the united daughters now look at this now <laughs> We should have seen something, man. That old lady, <laughs> them dumbass Jakes was helping, guess what? That's the daughter of one of these damn devils, man. And it's going to tell you how big of an organization this really is, man. And this wasn't that long ago, man. This is less than 50 years ago, man. Right? So like it, less than 60 years ago. This is Ecclesiasticus. Chapter 12 and verse 10. Never trust thine enemy. Right? A strange, foreigner, stranger. Never trust thine enemy. For like as iron rusteth, so is his wickedness. Okay? The Confederacy. The UDC was founded in Nashville in 1894 to preserve Confederate culture for generations to come. The women who made up the group descended from elite antebellum families, and they used their social and political clout to spread the pro-Southern version of the war as real history. You've probably seen their efforts to honor the Confederacy, but maybe... So lucky, I said, what, uh, 60 years. That's over, what, damn near 150 didn't know it was the UDC. They're the ones who covered the southern landscape with memorials for Confederate leaders and soldiers. They used their fundraising and lobbying skills to pressure local governments into erecting monuments in prominent public spaces like courthouses. Look, man, that's where you get all these damn monuments from, man. From these damn devils, man. This is Ecclesiastes 12 and 11. Though he humble himself and go crouching, yet take good heed and beware of him. And thou shalt be unto him as if thou hast wiped a looking glass, and thou shalt know that his rust have not been altogether wiped away. Right? It ain't wiped away, man. They still the same devils. State capitals. Installed here next to the state capital by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. The United Daughters of the Confederacy donated this memorial to the city back in the 30s. They put them along roadsides and in parks. Any place that was remotely relevant to the Confederacy was memorialized. By the early 20th century, the UDC had 100,000 members and chapters spread all over the country. 100,000 members and chapters spread all over the country, man. Right? but mostly in former Confederate states. And there's a reason they grew so quickly during that time. So we're talking about roughly three decades after the end of the war, and the Confederate veterans themselves are beginning to die off. So there is this push to find ways to commemorate it, because the big challenge by 1900 was there's a new generation of white Southerners being born, and they never experienced the, the war years. That push is visible. Most of the Confederate monuments were erected during the UDC's height of influence. There's a rhetoric around monuments that we want to get the this thing built before all of that generation has died off and the reason we want it is to teach future generations about those men dr karen cox this is the book of proverbs chapter 10 and verse 32 
The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked speak of forwardness, right? Death to you, Esau. Put the book on the UDC, and I asked her if it was fair to say the group established the lost cause as historical fact in the South. Oh my God, yeah. They were the leaders of the lost cause into the 20th century, and they made it a movement about vindication. Just to give you an idea. Let me go into this word, Salakian. Forwardness, right? For, forwardness, Salakian. Strong's H-8419, Tapuka, Tapuka. Tapuka, right? Salakia. Let me bring this back up. And it reads, well, Salakia, and it means perversity, a perverse thing. This is a perverse thing that these devils are saying. That the war wasn't about slavery. That that the monuments are only for the heritage. Now, nah, man, it's it's to commemorate and remember what the fuck they did to us, man. Right? Yeah, of how effective they were. They successfully lobbied for a Confederate memorial in Arlington National Cemetery, which U.S. President Woodrow Wilson proudly unveiled to a cheering crowd. Now that's influence, right? Monuments are the least of what they did. Uh, what? I mean, they, they are the most visible and tangible, but the work with children was far more influential. It turns out a central UDC objective is shaping how children think about the war and their Southern heritage. One of their most powerful tools, textbooks. Take a look at this pamphlet called A Measuring Rod for Textbooks. It was written by the illustrious Southern historian, Miss Mildred Rutherford, an educator, orator, and author of Southern history textbooks. She's also very pro-slavery. The pamphlet announced the formation of a textbook Book review committee featuring prominent Southerners like five former Confederate generals. This group was committed to spreading the truths of Confederate history, so they instructed school boards to reject any textbooks that did not accord full justice to the South. And they urged libraries to deface every full justice to the South. This is the book of Proverbs, chapter 19, and verse 28. An ungodly witness scorn of judgment, and the mouth of the wicked devour. Of Iniquity, right? Damn devils, man. We got your number now, though. I'll praise you. How about you have a shot? Book in their collection that didn't measure up by writing the words unjust to the South clearly on its cover. This pamphlet was shared widely with school boards throughout the South, and UDC-backed committees closely monitored history books to make sure Northern influence never reached classrooms. So the core language of an approved textbook aligned precisely with that. This is this is why this was uh so prevalent, right? So if y'all brothers haven't seen this video, man, go to Apostle uh uh Aramla uh page GMS info doc channel eleven, the shame of the Edomite nation, right? This is the article which which coincides perfectly perfectly with that damn video, man. It says for generations Children have been spared the whole terrible reality about slavery's place in U.S. history, but some schools are beginning to strip away the deception and evasions, right? But how was that set up? It was set up by them damn Edomite women, man. It was set up by those devils, man, right? Let me jump down. It says, think about this, 246 years slavery was legal in America. It wasn't made illegal until 154 years ago. Yeah, right, like I said, 150 years or so. It says, the 26-year-old teacher told the 23 students sitting before him at Fort Dodge Middle School, and that's an army base, man. So... What does that mean? It means slavery has been part of America much longer than it hasn't been a part of America, right? Let's go back to this video. Man, you devils gotta pay, man. 
of the lost cause. You know, stuff like the Confederacy lost in the war between the states, but Georgia never forgot to honor her Confederate soldiers. History of Georgia was on the UDC's approved list. It was also written by E. Merton Coulter, a self-described Southern historian and historian-described white supremacist. They are Man, listen, listen. This is Second Ezra chapter 6 and verse 27. For evil shall be put out, and deceit shall be quenched. As for faith, it shall flourish. Corruption shall be overcome, and the truth which hath been so long without fruit shall be declared. Man, the truth is being declared by you devils, man. The Most High God is making your own tongue to file upon yourself, man. Understand that how you educate, who wins the writing game, who wins the, the battle over history, ultimately wins the war. That's the big fight for the UDC. But their work with children went further than the classrooms. The UDC formed an auxiliary group called the Children of the Confederacy, which was designed to get kids born in former Confederate states to actively participate in their version of history. Listen, man. Yo, yo, uh, your co-worker, all this thing has been passed down to them, man. Listen to this, man. Group leaders had kids recite call and response truths from something called the Confederate Catechism. Children up to the age of 18 would compete and be rewarded for memorizing long passages of lost cause rhetoric. So it would be like an after school thing, you know, like that was your club. You would go after school to the meeting of the children of the Confederacy and your leader might teach you songs of the South like Dixie or other songs that were considered Southern patriotic songs. They would have them write essays, go visit the veterans and learn this catechism. Children were also the centerpiece of their community's monument unveilings, like this living flag at the dedication of the Stonewall Jackson Monument in Richmond. Yes, those are school children. The UDC's efforts shaped the identities of children who grew up with the lost cause. They made history personal, and that made their story last longer. Generations of generations of children learning that narrative in a variety of ways grow up to be, you know, segregationist in the 50s and 60s, because that's been drilled into them since they were children listen man <laughs> listen man you don't think these devils had little devils man matter of fact let's get that if the wicked are increased it is increased for the sword Salaki on the time. Let me see if I can get it right quick. <clears throat> if the wicked increases, it's for the sword, KJV. After World War I, the UDC started losing steam, but the damage was done. The monuments were in place, and the textbooks they wrote remained in Southern classrooms until the late 70s. And the women's group did it all without the right to vote. This is Proverbs. <laughs> These damn devils, man. They didn't had babies and babies and babies and taught this damn lie. But the Most High God says this. This is Proverbs 29 and 16. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increaseth, but the righteous shall see their fall. Right? Let me see. Man, exactly what I wanted. Let's see, that's it. That was a good precept, though. or participate in politics. You can still get glimmers of this lost cause memory of the war from people who will always choose to see it through the personal. And I think the UDC, to a great extent, was that was their goal. So the next time someone says the Confederate monuments are about remembering our history, just know that that's exactly what the United Daughters of the Confederacy wants you to think. Goddamn devils. Goddamn devils, man. You know what? 
If I find it, I put it in the description box. But I'm going to end it with this right here. It's the book of Job. Chapter 3. And verse 17. The wicked cease from troubling. And there the weary be at rest. Call Allah Yahweh. By Hashem, Yahweh By Hashem, Rakhadash. Double honors to the elders and apostles, great millstone. Much respect to the brothers laboring this truth worldwide. Till the next time I say, Shalom.